Good evening. <clears throat> it is my pleasure as president of the Carbondale branch of AAUW to welcome you, each and every one, members, guests, family, and friends, to another of our very interesting programs this evening. We're glad that you are here, and we hope that our program will make you feel glad that you attended. Before we get to the program, please allow me to take a brief diversion. I want to acknowledge that while our program is not a special feature of African American history, we do appreciate the importance of this recognition and celebration, and we encourage you to take advantage of some of the many exciting and informative programs that are offered this month. Two special sponsors have calendars of events. SIU has an African American history calendar. Carbondale United has a calendar on African American history. Also, the Carbondale Public Library webpage where you registered for this event is a great resource for many of the events this month. And of course, one of the positive effects of our climate of virtual meetings is that we can Google topics of interest and find people of national or international renown who are making presentations that are of top quality and often free of cost. My message, support African-American history by participating in events presented. Thank you for indulging me that diversion. Now we get back to tonight's program. Our order of the evening will be Samara Magdoom, our branch diversity chair, will introduce the presenters for our main program. Miriam Magdoom and Reem Kader will present a wonderful program on the importance of volunteering. The program will have a Q and A monitored and moderated by Marsha Anderson. We encourage you to enter your questions for the presenters as they come to mind. Enter your questions into Q&A if possible. If not Q&A, then feel free to use the chat box. After interaction with our presenters, our branch vice president for membership, Martha Ellert, will call on you to think about AAUW membership for anyone who can enhance our efforts at improving societal inclusion of girls and women. After that, I will return with a few closing remarks. Now, Samara. Thank you, Ms. Ellen Lacey. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing two young women and youth leaders, Reem Kader and Maria McDoom. Reem Kader is a former SIU Honors student and a Saluki ambassador who studied physiology. And Maria is a current fourth year SIU Honors student in the public health program. Between the two of them, they have extensive experience volunteering on campus, in their communities, and abroad. Today, they will be sharing a presentation titled, The Power of Volunteering, How It Changed Us and How It Can Change Society. With that, I welcome Miriam and Reem. Thank you. Hello, everyone. We'll be sharing our presentation at this time. All right, good evening, and thank you for attending our presentation on the power of volunteering. How it changed us and how it can change society. Uh, now, Reem will begin with just going through a quick overview of our presentation for the evening. So some things that we will be highlighting this evening are um, how volunteering can help heal our divided uh, country, how volunteering is vital to personal growth, 
how activism comes naturally after developing stronger relationships with those communities and to have faith to prevent activist burnout and despair. Thank you, Reem. Um, and now we have a few discussion prompts um, before the beginning of our presentation, just to sort of elicit any sort of responses or feedback uh, you might want to share. And so our first prompt is, can you describe a time when you felt overwhelmed or unsure regarding activist related work? And this can pertain to volunteerism as well. Our second prompt is, has anyone told you that you're taking on something bigger than you can handle? And if so, what was your reaction to that? And our third prompt, is there a piece of advice you wish someone told you in your, in your youth that you'd like to share today? What would you tell your younger self? My Zoom image was covering that. Um, now for these prompts, I'm going to include this in the chat below so that you can access them, but feel free to answer in the Q&A and in the um, chat if, if that's what you're able to. Um, see if I'm able to do that. Well, we can get back to that if I can't. <laughs> All right, well, um, keep these in mind as we go through our presentation. Now for um, our beginning is uh, discussing the difference between volunteerism and activism. Now for us, volunteerism is freely and willingly providing a service to a person, a community or an organization, whereas activism is campaigning to bring about social or political change. Now these two concepts are very similar and have been described as two sides of the same coin. And they are, but for our youth, from our youth perspective, we really encourage youth to first engage in volunteering in order to be successful activists. Um, and the reason for this is that we're presenting volunteering as a solution to a divided nation, that volunteerism has the potential to heal our polarized current climate. Over here on the right, you can see an infographic from the Pew Research Center. And these are poll results um, released last fall. And the results, um, the results show that only about one in five Trump and Biden supporters say they share the same core American values and goals. Now, a very small minority of Trump supporters and Biden supporters believe that we share a fundamental commitment to the same core American values. However, unfortunately, a vast majority of Trump supporters and Biden supporters believe that we fundamentally disagree about core American values. Now, this is really unfortunate because it creates rifts in our nation and divides and contributes to what the president of the American Enterprise Institute, a DC based think tank, coined the culture of contempt. Now, the culture of contempt is one in which that not only do we disagree with others, but we feel contempt towards those who we have fundamental ideological disagreements with. And there's a danger to this, that we should not avoid or cut off those we disagree with, but engage with them in a different way. Unfortunately, many people, and we've witnessed ourselves, Reem and I, as youth, uh, many people will not only um, avoid people they disagree with, but completely eliminate those from their own social circles. So now we have completely isolated ourselves from different opinions, and many of us are not able to tolerate them. Um, what we can do, though, is that just because you can't connect with others on one level, for example, um, activism or discussing your political beliefs, doesn't mean that you can't connect with others on another level, that you can connect with others and still make a positive difference in your community and still make a constructive difference with others by doing volunteering. And volunteering is another outlet that when done in a neutral setting can help build relationships and really strengthen our nation. And examples of neutral settings that you can volunteer in, um, the Boys and Girls Club, uh, reading at the library, um, volunteering at the Good Sam, the Warming Center, the Women's Center. And when you find that you build relationships with people in local settings and get to know them over time, people will actually be more receptive to different ideas and opinions because you've established a personal relationship built on mutual trust and respect. And that is the incredibly important point um, of volunteering. When you're giving service to others, you're also establishing 
establishing bonds that are really important and strengthen the ties of our community. So an example of how um, volunteering might be a way that you connect with others in a way that perhaps activism or sharing your political beliefs would not be able to is for example, say that I am um, as a younger person in um, class or something, and this could pertain to anyone, I'm discussing something that I'm really enthusiastic about or very passionate about. Um, say for example, it's the gender pay gap. And this is something that AAUW has a lot of experience with as well, I'm sure, um, with their advocacy efforts. But say I am trying to convince someone about the gender pay gap and um, that why we need gender pay equality. Um, and it just is not going through. I'm not able to convince someone. I'm getting frustrated. We're going nowhere. It's sort of like oil and water that we feel we just cannot mix. Um, but that's not the case. We can actually connect through a different level. And we can acknowledge that, okay, maybe we can't um, discuss and come to an agreement on one thing. Um, but we could go the volunteering route. I could tell someone, hey, I'm going to the warming center or I'm going to the women's center this, um, this weekend. I heard they could use some donations and I'm going through my closet through um, my closet and maybe you wanna take some old coats and we can go together. And that way you're still building really constructive ties and benefiting the community in a way that you might not be able to through activism at first. Um, and uh, that is why we think that Volunteerism, for one thing, is a solution to our polarized climate. Now for our next slide, volunteerism as a service, um, service as a vehicle for personal growth. Now one thing that we know about volunteerism is that it's good for us. It's very good for us. And this infographic provided by the United Healthcare and their um, campaign with volunteering um, polled people and of those respondents who volunteered in the past 12 months, 88% noted improved self-esteem. 93% of respondents noted improvement in mood. 75% of respondents felt physically healthier. So we know there's a bodily improvement and a bodily effect from service. 34% of respondents were able to manage their chronic illnesses better, 79% experienced lower stress levels, and 78% felt they had greater control over their health and well-being. Now, I can personally attest to the beneficial results from service, and actually there are times where I feel that I have personally benefited more from service than those who were the recipient of service. Um, and I have several examples, and I'll just share a few right now. Uh, one is with uh, spending time with my own grandmother, so starting, starting close to home. Um, I read with my grandmother and we both speak Sindhi, that's my mother's native tongue. And Sindhi is a Pakistani language. And now she's very good with English, but she wanted to improve her reading capabilities. So um, for the past, well, since last fall, really, we've been reading about half an hour to an hour together every night. And while her English has improved, her reading capabilities have improved, I have improved so much more in my own Cindy that I was not able to uh, just through talking. And I think my own mother can attest to this, that I've really improved a lot. And my own confidence grew in my speaking ability um, through having to discuss and explain certain concepts to my grandmother in a way that I understood and she could understand. It really challenged me to grow. And that's something that I feel really proud of. Another example of something that was mutually beneficial um, is participating in a program on campus called Conversation Partners. Now, Conversation Partners is a program that pairs uh, native English speakers who are SIU students and international students. Now, um, you speak together for um, like about a, an hour a week. It's very, it's a small amount of time, but over a couple months, we able, were able to build connections. And um, some of my partners have come from Japan and Saudi Arabia, two completely different cultures, two completely different um, countries, of course. And I learned so much from them and was able to keep in touch with them after our time had ended. And I've even, um, made a pen pal out of one of my partners from Japan and we exchanged a snail mail, which was really fun. 
Um, now, our last point for this slide is that teaching, uh, volunteerism teaches empathy and emotional intelligence. And something that I can attest to for this is my experience um, volunteering through the I Can Read program. Uh, it must have been my freshman or sophomore year of college. And I only spent a couple hours a week for one semester. And at the beginning, I thought, oh, this would be a great opportunity to read with some students and um, for a couple hours a week. And and I, it would be something fun for me. And I Can Read is a program uh, where I would read with just a few students in a classroom uh, after school hours. And I ended up becoming closer to the students and I felt very close to them, but I also learned about the realities in a way that I was not aware of before. And I grew, I, I built a stronger connection and understanding with my own community by listening to some of their experiences in a way that I knew I didn't have when I was younger. So for an example of this is when I was sitting with this young boy and we were supposed to be reading together. And he was this, he's the same age as my younger brother, uh, nine years younger than me. And um, they went to the same school together. And so I felt kind of closer to him anyways. And I had a book on in, in my lap and he had a book in his lap and we were sitting next to each other. And he was supposed to begin reading, but I think he'd come, we'd known each other for a couple of weeks at that point. And he turned to me and he started telling me his experience seemingly out of nowhere about how his father was shot in front of him. And I was totally taken aback. This was not an experience I was prepared for. It was not anything that I knew how to react to. And I'm sitting there in this chair thinking like, okay, how do I respond to this? I wanted to be professional and I wanted to be empathetic. And it really in that one moment pushed me to be an active listener, but a good listener. And I don't remember quite how I responded to him, but I do remember I just stayed quiet and I let him and I let him speak his story. And I feel like he got some release from that and he moved on and we continued to read. And he probably has forgotten me. He's probably forgotten that experience, but I will remember that for so much longer than he will probably ever remember me. And I felt so much closer to my own community by listening to certain stories that I felt like I had, I had no personal connection with. Um, and I think that's a really fitting example of how I learned to expand my own emotional intelligence and empathy just through that one ex um, experience, experience, <laughs> excuse me. So just as um, volunteering and these experience of mine challenged me to expand my worldview and learn about other people's realities at home in my local community, Reem will now be sharing a transformational experience of her own of a service trip that made a difference at the global level. So I will be switching slides now for Reem. So I wanted to speak about my experience and the opportunity that I was blessed to have last year, right around this time. So I went to Jordan with a relief and development organization called Helping Hands. And I'm not gonna lie, I was initially very nervous to go. Um, because I didn't know any of the other girls that were going or anyone that was really involved in this trip, but I decided to step outside of my comfort zone. And I'm so glad I did because I walked away with an experience I know I will never forget. So the main premise of this trip was to visit Syrian and Palestinian orphans and refugees. And we visited schools, orphanages, and several refugee camps. And we got to see the way that they were living. Um, we got to hear their stories of their lives and also just spend time with so many families and children there. Um, however, within just 10 minutes of stepping onto the first refugee camp, I couldn't help but feel this overwhelming sense of guilt. Um, I kept thinking that it's not fair that I get to live the life that I have while children half my age were living in the conditions that I was witnessing. Um, and their living conditions are what most of us would probably consider uh, as unlivable. One of our mentors walked us over to their quote unquote bathroom, which was merely a hole in the ground with a few sheets hung up surrounding it, um, which you'll see a little bit later in the video. But as you can imagine, especially in these cold winter months, those sheets don't really do a whole lot either. They're 
blowing around. They are not really stable. It's not used as a door or anything. So there was obviously no comfort, hygiene, privacy, or peace of mind for them to do something as simple as using the bathroom, which is something that I know we take for granted every single day. We don't even really think about that. Um, and when speaking to a lot of the little children, we asked if they went to school and most of them had never attended school a day in their lives, but it was something that they aspired to do. It's something that they did want to do and that they dreamt of, but they've just never had the privilege or opportunity um, to do that. So at the first camp that we visited, we were invited in one of the family's tents and the mother of the house told us her story. She explained that her and her kids fled from Syria and left her two sons and husband behind. And one of those sons passed away in an explosion in Syria um, a little bit later on. And they haven't spoken to the husband since they left and they don't know anything about him. And we asked one of the youngest or the youngest um, girl that was living in the house, she's 17 years old, her name was Amani. And we asked her what her hopes were for the future. And uh, without a second thought, she didn't even think of herself or anything like that. The only thing she said was, I just hope my father is alive. Um, and then another story, like the, the little boy that you see on the screen right now, um, there were six kids living in that tent. And we asked him, his name is Salem. Um, we asked him what he wanted, what he wanted as a gift or what we could bring him, anything at all. And the only thing that he could think of or that he wanted was a soccer ball. He just wanted a soccer ball so that he could play with the other children um, at his uh, camp. And at first I thought like, wow, these people are so humble. They're so simplistic. They don't need a whole lot to be happy because this was a trend between all of the children and the families. They didn't really ask for much. Um, but then after coming back home and reflecting more about my experience, I realized that it's not that they're just simple or that that little boy didn't want anything. It's that he simply didn't have the capacity to dream beyond a soccer ball. And um, from that realization on, I really learned what my privilege truly looked like beyond what words can explain. And although I still do carry some of the guilt with me that I mentioned earlier, I've realized the only way to help them and myself in this type of situation is using those feelings and turning them into productive actions and getting more involved to help. So thankfully through Helping Hands, um, we were able to install eight bathrooms for the camps. We installed a mobile school, um, two micro homes. Uh, we also provided in-kind gifts. So we provided like bags with rice and other food essentials, hygiene kits, and then also just a bunch of toys for the kids, which they really loved. Um, and although all of these things were so amazing, I know that there's still so much work um, to do and a greater difference that we can make for these people's lives. Um, and a way in which we can do that is joining others for um, similar causes and for um, the community's sake. So that that's exactly what I did. So um, in these pictures, you'll see a young girl um, at the bottom left corner. Her, her name is Rahaf. And I actually got to know her and this campaign through a fellow volunteer. Um, he took a trip a few weeks weeks before I did. And he met this uh, little girl and befriended her and got to know her a little more and found out that she wanted to be a lawyer when she grew up. That was her dream. And he was actually studying pre-law. That's what he was going to college for. So he really connected with her. Um, and they talked about, you know, um, her future and her life. Um, and she said, but like, I don't know how I'm going to do that because I don't have an education. <coughs> I don't go to school. So he decided to dedicate an entire campaign for her called uh, the School for Rahaf. And I um, was fortunately able to join that. And we raised enough money to open the mobile school that you see in the picture. Those are her and all of her friends at her camp. Um, the day that it was presented to them, it was decorated. They were super happy and excited. Um, and they ended up calling it the School of Dreams. Um, and yeah, so we were able to 
open that school up and also raise enough money to keep it open for the next three years. Um, because it does take a certain amount to keep the schools open. And we're going to revisit that campaign every year to make sure that um, their education keeps getting funded throughout their, um, throughout their, and then the next slide. And then these are some more pictures from the trip. So at the top left, that was the group of girls and I that went. Um, and another amazing thing that I've gained from this experience is not only all the things that I took away that I shared with you all, but also um, a new community and network of girls that I still keep in touch with. So we still have like a big group chat and we'll send like birthday messages and like life updates. And that's been really nice, just keeping in touch with them. Um, at the bottom left, there is a picture of a young girl and her younger brother at their camp. And then to the right is the inside of the mobile school that we delivered while I was um, on the trip. And then um, above it is a little girl resting her head on the desk of that mobile school. So that's been my experience um, with Helping Hands and kind of what I took away with it um, from it and what I've learned. And I hope it can um, inspire others to also kind of get out of their comfort zones and try to reach into um, impactful experiences. So now that Reem described how she used those feelings that she experienced on her trip and turned that into productive things uh, through the campaign and different things and returning home and spreading awareness mm -hmm. that she was maintaining that momentum, um, I'll be discussing a little bit about avoiding emotional burnout that can come um, after uh, spending time with activism and volunteering for a long period of time. And this is something that I've noticed uh, with youth as I discuss some of these things and from observing other people, um, is that it's very easy for people to have these certain waves of activism and waves of volunteering, which is quite normal as well. There are times where you're more enthusiastic and more passionate about your work and about promoting um, uh, about, about promoting a better quality of life for others. Um, but sometimes it's easy to be um, inundated with distressing news and to constantly be in that circle, especially for people who spend much time on social media and reading news, um, especially I'm, I'm sure everyone's familiar with the 24 hour news cycle um, that's constantly cycling through these different news stories. And if you're constantly in that circle, it can be very emotionally draining and you won't be able to give your best to your community. And what happens um, that I've noticed, especially with younger people, which can be quite, um, it can be quite disheartening to see that people become hardened and people become cynical and pessimistic. And they say, oh, this is just the way it is. You know, this is for so long, we've been working on race relations. We've been working with the climate. We've been working with, you know, gender equality and it, it just doesn't happen. And on the flip side, you see really positive, um, you see really positive people. And one of the, some of the role models I have is with um, these people, um, you all with AAUW as well, that you've been continuing with your same work and advocacy for so long. And I don't see that, that, um, that cynicism and pessimism that I do see from other people. Um, and so one of the things that we um, are encouraging for youth as well as to avoid that ton of vision, tunnel vision, to surround yourself with positive people, to take a break from the time, things when you need to, and to step back. Now, I'll just be quickly describing my own experience. The first time I was sort of, um, I opened my eyes to the world of activism and environmentalism um, at the ripe age of like, a 10 or something in middle school, <laughs> whatever age we are. And I learned um, through this amazing science class. And Reem and I actually have this, had the same uh, professor and very similar experiences. Um, and his name was Mr. Garth. And we, I think it's, I think most of the students in that class probably considered themselves like environmentalists after that class. But it was so inspiring to learn about that because he really helped us grow a connection to our world, to our communities, not just the big world, but to the communities. But what ended up happening is I was so enthusiastic about that. I was so passionate. I could speak for hours on deforestation, the sea levels rising, animal extinctions, you know, the polar bears, orangutans, 
Um, and I would convince other people. I mean, I could talk to my parents about like electric cars. And at that time, the only electric car was a Nissan Leaf. So you can see we've made a big improvement since then. But um, for me at that time, and also being exposed to um, news sources and constant articles about um, the basically the disintegrating state of the of the earth, it was very overwhelming. Um, and it is, and it, be, it came to a point where it is almost too overwhelming. And it's a little funny now to think of this middle schooler on the brink of despair. <laughs> but um, what ended up happening is that that those sort of feelings did kind of continue on after eighth grade, a little into high school. And what got me out of that bit of funk and what helped me to be positive and to not think of things as futile um, is faith. But um, I should also describe this climate despair as exactly what this feeling that I narrowly escaped is called climate despair. And this is a phenomenon where people view global warming as this fundamentally unstoppable force that nothing can be done about. And this is quite a futile look outlook towards the world. And it can lead to feeling hardened. It can lead to helplessness. And of course that helplessness if continued on leads to despair. And something that we wanted to touch on is how faith can protect you from that despair, especially when you're involved um, and surrounded by um, really disheartening um, environments. For example, when we went to that, um, those refugee camps for many people, it can be almost too difficult to bear. If you're working with the same um, for the same movements for too long and you're not able to recharge effectively, um, it can be very difficult. So what ended up happening that got me out of this sort of funk is I had read about this, um, this activist who's very prominent activist involved in the Black Lives Matter campaign. And she was very she was very passionate about her work and she was in um, she was organizing protests and demonstrations at the national level meeting with international figures constantly active and there were times where even she needed a break but what she said is what kept her grounded and prevented her from that hard-heartedness and that cynicism and pessimism is faith and i actually i connected with that and she said that if something is truly meaningful, if a cause is really worthy, that you can put your trust in God or whatever higher power you believe in. You can put your trust in God. And um, if you need to step away, someone, God will cause someone to replace you to keep that momentum going. That the world and the burden of the world is not on your shoulders. It's not on one individual alone. And this feeling really helped me gain a positive outlook in the world. This idea of you do your best and you let whatever higher power you believe in take care of the rest. And that's something that Reem and I really would like to encourage youth today, especially to keep in mind because we sort of have this charge to go at the highest pace, all your energy, all your enthusiasm and passion. Um, but we don't know as much about how to recharge because these ebbs and flows of enthusiasm are inevitable as I'm sure you all are aware. And we need something to keep us grounded and rooted to remind ourselves of the fundamental good in the world. Um, now that concludes our presentation for the evening. And we wanna say thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to share our experiences and our belief and the power of volunteering for a better world. Um, and we also would like to say thank you so much for giving this opportunity here with AAUW as well. Um, we just want to say how great of an example you are for us youth. And we know you've been dedicating your time and energy to advocacy efforts that are far more substantial than our own experiences. So thank you so much. Thank you. And we I, have. I think Marcia. I think Marcia is going to have some questions or comments. Following, yes, I, I, I certainly do, Ella. Thank, thank you so much to Marianne and Reed. What, what an inspiration you bring for all of us. And 
and it, it's uh, talking about a, a positive image for the future of our society. You truly exemplify that. So thank you so much. Uh, we do have a couple of questions for you. Uh, let's start off with with uh, with a question here from uh, I, I can get the right one here to uh, uh, to to, uh, to Miriam and let's see if if I can find it here quickly and. Uh, Marion, do you think you will ever do international volunteer effort uh, when we are past the effects of a pandemic? Uh, pandemic. Uh, if so, what might be your special focus? And if not, why not? Thank you for that question. Uh, may I know who asked that so I can think personally? Does it say who? Oh, yeah, Ella. Uh, I think Ella asked that question. Oh, Miss Ella Lacey. Thank you so much, Ella, for that question, Miss Ella. Um, that's a great question, and it's something that I do consider often. And actually, I'd also like to thank, um, I don't know if she's on the call, but Miss Olga Widener as well, who's been um, a very strong and encouraging force in encouraging me to actually um, move past my local level and to um, get involved at the international level. And she has so many great ideas. Um, and yes, I have considered that. And I'm studying public health and I'm interested in pursuing medicine. And I think health is something that I'm quite interested in, as well as um, building healthy communities through different types of work, coalitions and things. and. I do think that I would like to, but I think that I would like to spend time getting to know my community more as an adult. I think I'm still um, a, a youth and I would like to um, become more intimate with my community so that I'm able to represent them well at the international level. And that's something that I'm interested in working with. Thank you so much, Mary Ann. Reem, we have a, a question for you. Tell us more about uh, the Helping Hands program. Uh, is, is the support, what uh, is the support for the volunteers? How long is the commitment? Uh, do volunteers pay their own way? Just give us a little more information about Helping Hands and how you became involved with it. What inspired sure. you uh, to, to pursue knowing more about Helping Hands? Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. Um, so I actually was introduced to Helping Hands through Miss um, McDoom. So she um, kind of um, introduced the opportunity to a community group chat. And I noticed that it was in Jordan. And um, I have actually grown up visiting Jordan often. So I was familiar with the country and the area. And I've um, friends and family there, but I've never seen that part of Jordan and that side of it. So um, that is something that especially intrigued me. So I really wanted to um, go on that trip and that journey to see a different part of Jordan that I've never seen before and a different side of the country that I've grown up with. Um, and in regards to specifically like Helping Hands, so they do a trip like this um, every year. I think they skipped this year because of obvious reasons, the pandemic and everything. Um, but hopefully they will be able to um, start up those trips again. And they don't only do it in Jordan, actually. They have a lot of different projects. Um, I encourage anyone that is interested in Helping Hands to visit their website. I know they um, do some work with water wells um, in Africa. I know they've, I believe they visited um, India, um, Bangladesh. So they have a lot of different projects um, that they're involved in. And yes, the volunteers. So if you do want to be involved on one of those trips, um, the volunteers do um, pay for their expenses. However, I will say that they do keep it at a reasonable cost. I feel like compared to a lot of different programs and um, volunteering like abroad, um, it is pretty reasonable. So it is definitely um, a, something that um, everyone can kind of look into and learn more about. And if anybody has any other specific questions on how to get more involved, um, definitely reach out and don't be afraid to contact me because it's been a great experience and I've loved working with them, so. And this is a question for, for, for both of you. So as you've explored your time, I mean, you gave examples of, of being in middle school and uh, uh, how you got involved in volunteering at that time. But uh, 
uh, can you talk maybe about the first thing that caught your passion and how has that passion really evolved today? What is it that, that gave you the inspiration to keep going and, and to, to pursue that passion? Marion, you want to start? Or, well, I mean, either, either one of you. Start. Um, yeah, you know, it, I think it's quite a process to identify one's passion. Um, and I know for myself, at a younger age, we're definitely influenced by those around us. So I can see someone doing good and I'll say, wow, that's great. I want to do that. That's my passion. Um, and I think seeing my family work through healthcare, that was something that I was exposed to from a very young age and that felt natural for me. And as I grew older and um, explored my community on my own with my own um, experiences under my belt instead of just hearing about you know, my family, I realized that um, I have many different passions and some are certainly personal, you know, personal, passionate, passionate projects of mine and others are things more service related. And I think the goal for many people is to connect your personal passions with those that are more out, outward and that are more service-based. And for me, I'm still on that path to finding that. So it's a mix of, I guess, um, educating myself on topics that are of interest to me, as well as doing concrete things. So one of the things um, beyond health that I'm passionate about, I guess, fundamentally would be about community and community health. And these are things that I explore from different angles. So with my mosque, I was very, um, very blessed to have had a really warm and nurturing environment since I was young and to be able to give back. So through little things like weekly bake sales or um, through organizing youth camps for, you know, my fellow friends and stuff. And then perhaps at the university level, doing anything that's related to community. Um, so I guess very broadly, I've identified my passion as community health. That's a very good question. Um, as Miriam mentioned, it's not, you know, necessarily always like a super easy thing to pinpoint, but I think kind of what, um, how I started out, I guess, is through middle school, like literally just being involved with like beta club, like that's a service um, club. And that was just kind of like a thing that everyone did, like all my friends, like we were in beta club and we had like our little, and it didn't really mean anything to me back then. I didn't think about it too much. And then on high school, I joined key club. So that was like the like parent version, I guess, of beta club. And then as I grew older, I started to realize why those experiences were and could be more meaningful. So sometimes it is just as simple as like literally being involved in things that maybe you don't really care about as much. Um, but then growing that once you realize like, oh, this kind of is meaningful and like this does have a deeper meaning. And then me specifically, I think also my personal background, like growing up very um, grounded and connected with my Palestinian culture um, and visiting Palestine and Jordan, I think definitely inspired me and had um, a, a say in that and a role in what I kind of want to pursue more so like for example taking the step with um like the palestinian and syrian refugees like that was you know an opportunity to do that so um just kind of yeah starting out in like little clubs like that and then growing it into something bigger and better Great. thank you so much <laughs> one of our our participants said to tell young people to volunteer in the field where uh, they'd like to work or to volunteer where your heart is. And so I think that that's really what uh, what you've already said. You, you both exemplify that, don't you? Uh, how, do, how do you get your friends involved? In, any, any specific way that you recruit your, your friends and sh share your passion? Um, sure. So I think that can be challenging sometimes, especially when they maybe don't share the exact same visions that you do. But um, kind of starting with baby steps, I think like 
literally if there's just like a little event that might be fun or that might pique their interest like for example on campus i'm involved or i was involved i graduated now um with dance marathon so that was like an organization that um helped raise money for the local children's hospitals and maybe not everyone would be interested in that firsthand but then if you explain to them like oh, it's an event, like there's going to be free food, there's going to be music, like there's going to be games. That kind of starts like ringing like what they want to hear and what they might be interested in. And once they're there and once they learn more about that, um, that would hopefully, you know, encourage them to kind of look deeper into um, what it's about and past like the free food and the games. But kind of just piquing their interest and seeing what maybe somebody would um, be interested in initially and then building off of that. Yeah, and I think also just to add on to that, um, after listening to Reem, especially talk about Beta Club and those baby steps, is that um, it's very difficult to be passionate or interested in something that you don't have access to or that you've never been exposed to. And I was talking with my mom about this earlier and she was telling me that when she was younger, she doesn't remember as many opportunities to volunteer and these constructive service opportunities that we have now. And I think increasing the opportunities so that it's visible is just one way for people to be able to actually experience those service opportunities. If it's not available and no one sees it, I don't think they'll ever know they're passionate about it. Um, and I think as, as we get older, Reem and I, and as older generations age, um, it might be our responsibility to bring those opportunities um, out and to showcase them and to tell people like, hey, this is here. Um, you might not have known about this, but um, the, these opportunities are available. And as the commenter said before, in across different fields and opening up those opportunities as broadly as possible so that anyone can, th can think about them and have access to them. Wonderful. Well, again, we want to thank you. Do you have any additional words of advice before we pass on to the next part of our program? Anything else you'd like to say to AU, number, AAU members and other participants tonight? Okay, so with that, we thank you again for your, your inspiration and keep that enthusiasm going and, and keep rubbing it off on all the other people also. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Reem and Mariam, for that very inspiring presentation. We've all learned so much and really gives us a hopeful feeling of, for the future. Um, I've been asked to say a few words about AUW. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, it uh, stands for the, used to be called the American Association of University Women, AAUW, very old organization. And at the same time, very much up to the minute, weighing in on issues relating to gender equity. As to being an old organization, AAUW was founded in 1881. So over 130 years, it's been a leading voice promoting equity and education for women and girls. We have over 170,000 members and we have a thousand local branches of which our Carbondale branch is one. Membership is open to anyone, male or female, holding an associate's or equivalent degree from a regionally accredited institution. As for being very relevant in the present, AAUW has published hundreds of research reports. Going back to 1885, uh, which addressed a prevailing myth that college impairs a woman's fertility, to most recently, a study that documents the economic impact of sexual harassment in the workplace. And through the years, AAUW has supported the academic achievements of many thousands of scholars, from the scientist Marie Curie to astronaut Judith Resnick, and many more in between. AAUW's advocacy has propelled countless new laws working tirelessly for their passage, including the Equal Pay Act, finally passed in 1963, the Title IX Amendment in 1972, the Family and Medical Leave Act in 1993, the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act in 2009. 
Our mission statement is simple, to advance equity for women and girls through research, education, and advocacy. The national organization provides fellowships, grants, and awards. AAUW has awarded over $115 million in fellowships and grants to more than 13,000 scholars and organizations. It's one of the largest scholarship programs for women in the world. AAUW also funds pioneering research on women, girls, and education. Through our Legal Advocacy Fund, it challenges sex discrimination in higher education and in the workplace. Our Carbondale branch was founded in 1927, and our ways of doing things have certainly changed and evolved over the intervening 93 years, but the core mission was, has been the same, to advance gender equity for women and girls. We host monthly programs September through May. Everyone is welcome to attend any of our programs. We also work to achieve our mission by providing scholarships to women students at SIU. We would welcome anyone who shares our goals to join AAUW. Through a special program, anyone attending one of our public events such as this one can do so at a much reduced introductory rate for the first year. Students are very welcome to join at an even lower rate. And we're very proud that one of tonight's speakers, Mariam, has been a student member of our branch. If you are interested in joining or just getting more information, you may inquire through our Facebook page, Carbondale Branch AAUW, or send me an email. I'm going to try to give my email address, M S as in Sam, E-L-L-E-R-T, at AOL. So you know how old I am then. Uh, please also contact me if you wish to receive notices of our programs. All of our branch meetings and programs are open to the public and everyone is welcome. We're very glad to have had you with us this evening and now I will turn it back over to our president, Ella Lacey. Thank you, Martha. Um, I just want to say that program, that presentation was so wonderful. Um, I enjoyed every moment. And from some of the comments that I saw on the chat and everything, people thought it was no less than awesome. So thank you so much. Uh, you know, we, we, we really congratulate you on what you've already done. And we're, we will be looking forward to hearing about your various future endeavors. I think you've helped us all to be motivated to do more to help all and to be able to participate in the shared dream for a better future for everybody. So thank you again. I also want to thank the other panelists. Oops. <laughs> for your part, excuse me, in supporting um, tonight's program. I would like to give a special thanks to the Carbondale Public Library for partnering with us and providing the technical expertise to bring this program to our community via their Zoom service. And as we look ahead, March is Women's History Month. Be on the lookout for the calendars, but one particular day of note is Monday, March 8th, which is just before our next program. It is International Women's Day. And on that day, there's a virtual event, a film featuring Eleanor Roosevelt that's sponsored by the local chapter of the United Nations Association of the USA. And it's at 7 p.m. Um, I believe it's uh, on the law school uh, Zoom site. No, it's the library Zoom site, I think. Anyway, more information will be very available on that. Our last item, I want to remind you that one month from tonight, March 9th, as you see for the closing remarks here, Rebecca O'Neill, a clinical professor at SIU School of Law, will present some legal tips for caregivers. So we look forward to seeing you one month from now. Thank you so much.